Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the stream. David Snowpack here from Snowpack Games. Let me see what kind of eyeballs we have going. All right. Restream says we have a couple of eyeballs. Uh, of course, I don't know who you are. I just see a number of eyeballs unless you say something in chat. So please say hello in chat so I know somebody out there is watching that i'm not just talking to the void and uh yeah if you're working on a game dev project let me know what you're working on i love uh to hear about what everybody is doing so uh, i usually like to start these streams with a little bit of play testing of the uh live game the released game uh, we'll just do like one match and then get down to uh to the real thing hey edward hey hojat i'm sure i'm totally mispronouncing your name sorry about that thanks for joining me um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up a match, uh, start a match with a live game, uh, which you can get for, uh, free on itch.io. I will put the link in a second, um, so that we can play a quick round together. So you can get an idea of what the game is that we're working on. Uh, and then I think I'd like to try playing the broken version with the new networking model that we've been working on over the past four weeks or so. Um, and see how that works. But you know, you want to see what the game is before we really dig into it, right? You want to see it actually operating. So here you can get the game from itch. It's pay what you want. You could want to pay nothing. That's fine with me. You can also play it right in the web. Um, the web version is cross play with the Steam version and the downloads. And let me get a match ID. So I'll create a private match. When you log in here, you'll go to join a uh, private match and you will copy and paste this match ID that I just put in the chat. While we are waiting for people to join, um, I'm gonna explain what we're, what we're gonna be working on today. So let me get up my terrible uh, drawing <laughs> that I've been using uh, to explain what rollback and prediction is. Uh, I will make this super brief, especially for the people who've had to suffer through it for like four or five weeks. Um, so <sighs> uh, let's get rid of some of these lines, some of my previous lines. What am I doing? Am I just drawing more dots? I'm drawing more dots. All right, so we have got two clients playing the same game together. We've got player one over here, player two over here. When the game starts, they're each doing their individual frames one by one, frame one, frame two, frame three. Player one starts by pressing right on all of the first three frames. Player two starts by pressing left on the first three frames. There is a two frame lag between the clients. So it takes two frames for information to travel from one to the other. Um, so that means on the first frames, one, two, and three, they have no idea what the other client is doing. So they're just seeing the client sitting still. So let me actually delete these L's here because it's all question marks. Nobody knows. Because there's a two frame delay, by frame three, uh, player two's left will have reached player one. A very naive version of network synchronization is to just inject the left here and then keep going onward, which would mean that player one is always seeing player two in the past from two frames ago. Uh, a more sophisticated form of network synchronization, which is actually what we are implementing in the game, is rollback and prediction. And the way that works is rather than injecting this L here, uh, it gets the game state on player one's client gets rolled back to frame one. The left is injected there because we know it came from frame one. And then the subsequent frames are predicted, uh, which is usually just a matter of saying, hey, they were probably pressing the same thing as they were last frame. So we inject all of these lefts uh, and roll back forward. The player on this client doesn't see any of this rolling back. They just see suddenly on frame three that player two jumps to the position that they would be at if they had been pressing left for the previous three frames. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> that is rollback and prediction. That is the network synchronization uh, technique that we are trying to integrate into Retro Tank Party from its previously more naive implementation where we just kind of saw the other players in the past. So let's see if anyone's joined up. Ooh, Silver1063, thanks for joining. Uh, we'll see if anyone else gets in there. Um, I'm gonna just quick talk about um, 
what I did since the last stream. Although actually maybe there's going to be another wait because like I'm going to be I want to play the the broken version <laughs> with everyone too uh, before we get started so we can so we can try and improve it uh, if it even works at all right. Um, so let's just let's just play a match silver. Let's do this. Um, let me just check the eyeballs. Ah, we got maybe another eyeball. Uh, you know, if you're watching, please say hello in the chat. I have no idea who's there. If you don't say anything to me, let's check out Retro Tank Party. Uh, let's just do, I don't know, which is two players. We'll just do a really quick battle royale. Play on the desert so we can get a whole bunch of power-ups. Let's do this. Oh, Elliot, you missed joining the match? Yeah, it's kind of a stalemate until we can get some sweet, sweet power-ups. They should spawn in a second. Ah, I'm not hitting you for nothing. Ooh, ooh, I took some hits there. Oh, here we go. Taking that. <laughs> That's a zap power-up. Oh, spread. You're going down. <laughs> I, I have a feeling this is the first time Silver has played, so they're just getting a feel for the power-ups. You just picked up an invisibility power-up. You use the ability power-ups by right-clicking. I'm actually going to pick up this tar this tracer. It's less powerful, less damage. Ooh, you're invisible! <laughs> but I have the tracer bullets! <laughs> yes, the tracer bullets. Less powerful, but they will follow your opponent uh, wherever they are, which was the perfect uh, counter to invisibility. All right. Get over here, Silver. Taking you out. Uh, yeah, two players. Kind of a stalemate until we get some power-ups. Alright, what do we got? Health? I'll take it. What do we got over here? Ooh, he's got a railgun! Ooh, I got a railgun! <laughs> Double railguns. Let's see what else I can get. Ah, uh, spread. I don't know why I just picked that up. I should have left it. Spread versus railguns, no good, because railguns got the range. I don't know how I'm going to get him. Tracers? Mm. No, I'm stuck! Why am I stuck? Got stuck on that little roadblock there. Ah, I should have stuck with tracers. I don't know why I took spread. He's going to totally beat me. He's going to totally beat me! I will get you. Silver 1063. This one's for the whole, the whole tamale. Is that a real saying, or did I just make that up? I think it's a real saying. Maybe the whole enchilada is is maybe the real one. <laughs> the whole pick a random uh, Mexican food. <laughs> All right, here we go. Spread. Oh no, he's already got a railgun. Ooh. Oh, some lag going on there. A little bit of latency going on between me and Silver Ten Sixty Three here. Oh, I need that health. I took a couple of hits there. Oh, let's keep my distance. Okay, let's stay close to this. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> Here we go, this is even better. I can get real close and then totally take him out! Okay, come on. Ah! <laughs> I was playing too risky! Beginner's luck, Silver1063. Beginner's luck. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot's cheering for silver. You're traitor. <laughs> All right. So that's the working game. That's the game as it is released on Steam version uh, 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 1.1. Edward, are you silver? Is that who you are? Winrar? Um, let's check out the, the broken version that has the current implementation of rollback. Um, I will send you guys a web link. We have to play the web version. Because the build process is a little more complicated for the rollback uh, edition, if we can call it an edition. Um, and I didn't... Ooh, and of course I have to turn off the sound. Hang on, guys. The music is pretty sweet, but we're gonna we're not going to stream with it. Um, so here, let me give you guys this link. And I will get a new uh, match ID. And this is the current unfinished version of the game that uses rollback and prediction. And um, it has <laughs> it has some problems. So uh, I'll take this opportunity while we're waiting for people to join the second time around to talk about what I worked on since last stream. So last stream ended. We were trying to get the game playable. We had gotten it basically playable, uh, but like the whole kind of 
uh, match workflow for Battle Royale wasn't fully working, like you'd kill everyone and then the match wouldn't actually end and the score would be recorded wrong and all these things. So Battle Royale is now mostly working. As far as I know, it is working, like it just is. Uh, <laughs> barring bugs I don't know about. Um, also, I did a bunch of um, optimizations around syncing the turret position. So the way that um, the, the uh, game decides when to roll back is that it compares the uh, input that it's getting with what it predicted. So here, we haven't received uh, the input for frame two yet, but we will on the next frame. It'll come in here. And then the game will look back and say, hey, we already predicted a left, so we're cool. We don't actually need to roll back to frame two and roll things forward because we predicted left. Um, and that works great for movement. Uh, the problem is that in Retro Tank Party, your turret follows the mouse. And it is basically always different, right? Because you move even a pixel, even a pixel over, and it, the turret position is going to be different. So basically, uh, no matter what happened, it was always saying, oh, we got the prediction wrong, and rolling back. And hey, <laughs> Unfa, <laughs> hey, man, thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, so anyway, I, I introduced an optimization where it's actually not taking into account the turret position when uh, deciding whether or not to roll back. Uh, do I have the code here? Um, I added a, a kind of thing where if you returned some bit of input with a negative number, it would just not count it for checking. And then I changed the tank's prediction code. Let me get to it. Um, where is predict remote input? Well, this is like not alphabetical. Okay. Um, and so it, rather than taking like what the last turret value was as the prediction, it's actually grabbing the latest input that we've gotten from that client. So the turret, we are actually seeing like naively synchronized. We're seeing it back in time uh, and not doing like uh, a normal prediction or correction or rollback or anything for it, but that's probably fine because the only time the turret matters for gameplay is when you're shooting. And that's the only time that we're like actually considering the appropriate turret position for that frame. Um, so we're not rolling back all of the time. And uh, yeah, then I started working on latency and uh, dealing with latency and packet loss and all that kind of stuff, which is mainly what we're going to be working on today. Um, and I will talk about that maybe more once we get started. Oh, Silver's back in. Okay. Oh, hey, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining the the, the stream, Unfa. I've been seeing in the uh, Rocket Chat that you've been uh, trying to get networking working in Godot 4. I haven't had a chance to really do too much in Godot 4. I've mostly just been like participating in proposals and PRs and stuff, but not actually trying to make any games. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see that, that somebody like yourself is actually like taking that for its paces. All right, Silver, let's see how badly this breaks with our new with our new rollback and prediction method here. We'll do the same thing. We'll do another two two points to win battle royale. Uh, let's do the desert again because there's lots of power ups and like map is too big to be interesting for two people. We'll spend the whole time looking for each other. All right, let's do this. Ooh, so there's already a bunch of uh, frame rate issues that I'm having, probably because I'm running the web version, that might not have anything to do. Whoa! <laughs> with the network synchronization. The fact that we're actually playing and we haven't lost sync is good. I should have opened this in Chrome. The performance. Ooh, we lost sync! We lost sync. Okay, you know what? In fact, I will start it in Chrome. Let's do Chrome. Uh, the performance is way better in Chrome. We'll hopefully get a. Um, better test here, but that wasn't the worst. Um, wasn't the best either. <laughs> we were able to play for a whole minute. The synchronization loss thing is something else I want to work on, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to start on it today. We're only streaming for two hours, so who knows how much we'll actually be able to get to. But right now, if uh, the clients get out too far out of sync, it just gives up. Um, here's a new match ID, Silver, if you uh, have the time to jump in again. Uh, and I want to I want to change the game so that when synchronization is lost, it will uh, just like pause and try to reestablish synchronization. And of course, that could also be terrible <laughs> if it happens all of the time. Um, so we definitely need to improve things so that it's more robust to latency issues and 
uh, you know, lost packets and that. Um, but in the case that we do lose synchronization, I don't want to just totally give up and like bail entirely, um, you know, to have it actually make an attempt to, to get back in there. All right, so 100 milliseconds ping means about 50 milliseconds latency, which I've tested the game with 50 milliseconds latency, and oh, the Elliot tried to get in, but the Elliot has left. <laughs> Probably you tried to join um, after we already hit start. Sorry, Elliot. Um, yeah, let's just do Battlefield, because who knows how long the match is going to last. There we go. Much better frame rate. Hopefully you guys can tell on the stream um, that the frame rate is considerably better in Chrome. That's just HTML5 um, with Godot. With Chrome, it's uh, usually more performant. So this is looking good, man. There's like a little bit of artifacts, a little bit of rubber banding when you change direction. But, oh, Railgun doesn't work. Ah! <laughs> I haven't managed to port Railgun yet, so I picked up a useless Railgun. No! Need to get a power-up that actually works in the in this version of the game. Ah! Taking too many hits. Taking Railgun again. Gee, oh, hey, it sort of worked. I haven't ported that. That shouldn't work at all. <laughs> it's just going everywhere. Never ending Railgun. <laughs> That's kind of cool, actually. I'm gonna die. Shoot me, kill me. Let's start this round over. <laughs> oh my god. So the round actually restarted, so that's good. That's that's something that wasn't working last week on stream. And let me get a spread or something. I gotta I gotta get a power-up that works. I made this game. I should be I should be destroying, not letting silver take me down. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys are seeing that, but when he changes direction, there is some rubber banding. And um that is something I'm really worried about with this particular uh, networking technique, is all the rubber banding. <laughs> you just realized your weapon is useless. Your railgun is no good here. <laughs> Where are you, Silver? But I, I have a feeling um, the physics problems that we've been having, Zap won't work either. None of the secondary power-ups will work. Um... I, th I have a feeling that to deal with the rubber banding, we're going to need to have a separation between the visual, um, the visuals of the uh, the game from the uh, like underlying state of the game. And to do that, we're going to need to have some custom physics going on, which we're going to have to do anyway, right? Uh, with Godot three, there is no way to get deterministic physics in the game. Uh, we, why did I pick up the railgun? <laughs> ah, I'll just go forever! Um, oh, I can still open the boxes, though. That's good. Um, so I'm kind of thinking I want to make the game playable by as many people as possible. Which is why we're dealing... Ah! <laughs> which is why <laughs> we're dealing with the latency. Oh, jeez, this is insanity! Just kill me, Silver. Take me out of my misery. Whoa, did I just get all my health back? That was weird. Take me out of my misery, Silver. Let this be done. I just want to see that the match ends right. Fine, I'll kill you. <laughs> Alright, does... Oh, that's horrible. Uh, This match should have been over. <laughs> okay, let's let, let's quit while we're sort of ahead, kind of, in some kind of way. That's the that's the state of, of the rollback version as of now. I'm surprised that the, the game didn't end correctly there. It should have. I, I tested that. Um, but I'm not surprised that the railgun wasn't working. Um, that I haven't even begun to work on for the for the rollback and prediction. Um, I think it just needs to save some additional state that the other bullets don't need to save because it has all of those reflections. Um, but yeah, so what we're going to be addressing today <laughs> is not the overall playability. Oh, hang on, let me see who's who's chatting up in here. Oh, hey, Ricardo. Hey. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I'm sorry, Iride, Iride. But thanks for thanks for joining. Uh, that's awesome that you were watching the the back videos yesterday. But yeah, I mean, you saw it's it's as playable as that, which is better than the previous video you just watched. So that's something. <laughs> so what we're going to be working on today is making the game deal better with high latency and packet loss. Um, until I started working on this a few days ago. If I set the latency, like set up artificial latency for 100 milliseconds, which is a 200 millisecond ping, right? Because it's round trip uh, is ping. Um, 
it would just it would just lose synchronization in about one second. <laughs> <laughs> One second after the match was started, it would just lose synchronization. And uh, I ended up improving it such that I can actually run the game uh, with a 200 millisecond ping, and it will be playable more or less, right? Um, I can actually show you that. Let's let's start simulating some, some latency, because we are going to be doing that quite a lot today. Uh, i got to get up my dock that's got the command lines that I copy and paste to do this. We're using, because uh, I'm on Linux, we're using a tool that sets something up in the kernel um, to create artificial latency. The tool is called TC. And let's set up a latency of, we'll start small-ish, 100 milliseconds. And, ooh, I added this cool button. We'll see if it actually works, because um, I haven't tested it in a minute. Hey, there we go. So uh, I don't know if you guys went uh, watched the Godot Con that just happened um, last week Friday or no last week Saturday Saturday this past Saturday. Uh, one of the presentations was about networking, um, and uh, the presenter had created this cool like multi-run button, which will actually start a variable number of uh, clients and pass in different command line arguments for each of them. So I have it set up to start. Uh, two clients and get all the way connected, like so I don't have to log in, choose matchmaking, press the ready button uh, via some command line arguments. So I'll move one of these clients down here so that's not so weird having them right on top of each other. And we will try a battle royale. This is with 100 milliseconds of latency. So assuming we don't crash before I get there, which I'm hoping we won't, you will see that there is some rubber banding. So or maybe not. Hey, the oh, okay, I'm seeing it. There we go. So when I change direction, you'll see like that the my tank jumps really far. So I'm controlling the upper window and watching this lower window. So you should be watching the lower window to see the rubber banding because that's the one that's doing the prediction. So see every time I change direction, uh, hopefully you can see that given that the frame rate of the stream is 30 FPS and the game frame rate is at 60. If you don't see it, let me know in the chat so I, so I know I'm not just like talking gibberish here. Um, so still basically playable at 100 milliseconds. Let's add some more latency. Uh, what am I doing? I have my document over here. Uh, so the game deals really badly with changing the latency while the game has already started, uh, which is not good. We want the game to be able to robustly handle latency spikes. But here, this first command is going to clear out the latency we set. And this next command is going to increase the latency We'll do a modest 150 milliseconds. So that's just a 50 millisecond increase, which could totally happen. Like at a moment during a match, uh, it could jump up to 150. Oops. I have to sudo the second command. Hang on. What am I getting wrong here? Cannot delete. Oh, because I already deleted it. The first command worked. The second command failed. So it's saying you can't reset something that's already been reset. All right. So let's see, ooh, ooh, synchronization lost. So that's a problem. <laughs> that's one of the things we're gonna be trying to address today. Um, since it has completely restarted the match and it's gonna press ready for me, I think. Are you? No, that's weird, should have pressed ready for me. Um, but you can see we have 150 millisecond latency, which comes out to about 300 uh, millisecond ping time. Oh, it did press the ready button for me, it just didn't work. Lame. All right, let's just close this thing all over. Starting again is no problem with our super multi-run add-on. Uh, if anyone is interested, let me know. I can throw the um, the link for that add-on into the chat. Hey, Lucas. Thanks for coming. Let's go try 150 milliseconds, which should still work. 150 milliseconds works, 200 milliseconds works. We'll just quick look at how choppy it is. So again, I'm controlling the top window. Watch the bottom window to see the rubber banding. So the rubber banding happens because we are predicting uh, what the tank is going to do. And then the real info comes in like, oops, we predicted wrong. And so it has to put the tank in a drastically different position, which for some movements you don't even notice. For other movements, you will totally, totally notice. But I like how the, the turret is pretty well synchronized. You can see that it's got, you know, uh, 150 millisecond delay, um, but it, it's smooth. Ooh, that was crazy. <laughs> we like jumped. All right, so let's do, um, let's switch this to 200 milliseconds. 
see if it handles it. It won't. Nope. Crashed right away. We will again just restart the whole thing. You guys can see the upper limit of the latency that this uh, can handle. And uh, just so you know, the, the, the goal that I have is that it should be able to handle a latency of 320 milliseconds. Because the way that I've coded the synchronization library, like it should be able to handle that. That should theoretically be possible. Um, but right now it isn't. Our upper, our upper bound is 200 milliseconds, which, ah, oh, we lost synchronization before I could even show you. All right, let's try this again. Will it get us back in there automatically? Come on, come on, come on. Come on? No. <laughs> One last try, and then uh, we'll get down to work here. Okay, so now I'm controlling the bottom window, and the upper window is the one that's going to be doing prediction and rollback and all of that stuff, because it is the one that is receiving new information. So at 200 milliseconds, look at how nasty those that rubber banding is. That artifacts are just out of control. The shooting actually seems okay. Like you can tell that the bullet is starting like way far out from the gun because uh, that's how long it took for the message that we have fired to get there. But at least it's not starting, you know, back at the the turret itself. It's starting at the position that it should be at, based on the um, uh, the synchronization that they're doing. And it's actually like really accurate. If you watch the two windows, once the bullet appears up here, it's in roughly the same spot as it is on the lower window. So even though this upper window is missing the earlier information, they are like in real world time still synchronized despite the, the 200 millisecond delay. All right, so what I did to finally get the game working at these higher latencies as well as it is now, which of course isn't great, um, is uh, I was watching kind of how the, the clients were behaving and uh, found that there was a death spiral. And I, I think there probably is another death spiral <laughs> buried in here. Um, and I will explain to you the death spiral that I found. Um, basically, the way that we're, ha we're passing these messages, uh, we're passing them unreliably, meaning we're not using reliability at the lower level protocol. Like if you send messages over TCP, uh, there's reliability built in. Um, if you're using some sort of like, uh, uh, reliability layer over UDP, like is built into WebRTC or the um, ENET library. Both of those are, are in, usable in Godot. Um, those will basically send a message and wait for the recipient to send back an acknowledgement that they receive the message. And if they don't receive it in time, they uh, send the message again. And that's that kind of low level reliability. It doesn't know anything about what you're sending or how often you're sending it or you know what's in it. It's just like saying, okay, you sent a message and I'm gonna send this act and do whatever. And that is fine if you are sending bursts of data. Um, like you open a web page and there's like a big burst of data, 99% of those messages get there, all those acknowledgements come back. Uh, your browser says, oh, I didn't receive these couple ones, and then, you know, or the server says, I didn't receive acknowledgements for these couple ones, and then sends those last ones to the browser, and all is good. That doesn't work great for games uh, using this technique where we're sending input because we are sending data every single frame, so 60 times a second. We're sending a, a continuous stream of data. So we are using a, um, a technique which I think is called like the sliding window acknowledgement technique or something like that, um, which is super common in games. Uh, how do I make a new thinger? I need to make a new plus. Plus is new, right? Great. So the way this sliding window, whoa, what am I drawing? Oh, I, I was expecting it to be like a snapped line, but it's, a, it's not. I'm just drawing. It's just a pencil. OK. I can draw. No, I can't. Um, sorry. Uh, so here's the two clients. We have player one's client, player two's client. And on every single frame, we are sending data because we, we have to. Even if we have, if there's no new input, we have to send uh, a message saying there is no new input. Um, because otherwise it doesn't know, uh, you know, did I just get nothing because the player pressed nothing? Um, or did I get nothing because I haven't received the message yet, and maybe later I'm going to have to roll back uh, to fill in that data. So we have to send like a no data message. 
Um, and we are not using low-level reliability. Uh, we are baking the acknowledgement in by the fact that we are always sending messages. So here we go. This, and we're still assuming this two-frame delay. Uh, we'll number these frames. Uh, we don't want to start at one though, because that will be harder to make an example out of. We'll start. We'll start at ten. Then I don't have to erase my one. <laughs> ten, eleven, twelve. Um, so this frame from player one goes to player two, and it says this is my input, but it also says the last frame that I received from you was frame eight. And uh, then player two counts that as acknowledging all of the frames, frame eight and below. And so then what this player does when it sends its next packet, um, which I guess would have to start here, right? Because now it knows that it got frame from frame eight. Um, it is sending not just the input from frame 12, it's sending all of the input from frame eight through frame 12. So all of those back frames. And it's saying, hey, the last frame I got from you was frame 10. And they're, const they're always sending all of the input up until the point that they've acknowledged and also this acknowledgement in the same message, which saves a round trip. Um, and we can do that because we know what we are sending we are, and we know that we are constantly sending, right? Let me check out chat here for a second. I first heard of rollback in Smash Bros. Melee scene where they implemented it in Slippy, a uh, modded dolphin. <laughs> all right. Yeah, does, does the normal Smash Bros. use rollback? Um, or is that just like where they modded it in to do it? Because having played Smash Bros, it doesn't feel like it has rollback, which is a dumb thing to say because like, how can you really tell? But like, <laughs> based on what I know about networking, like it doesn't feel like it's using rollback because it, you don't see like the kind of artifacts and, and uh, uh, things that you would expect. Um, so maybe just let me know if, if you know if that's just a mod or whatever. Lucas is asking, how do you think you could minimize the rubber banding? That is a good question. Uh, because using different uh, networking synchronization techniques, I would use some techniques that I don't think we can use when we're doing rollback. Um, so for example, uh, when you're dealing with a server and you have a client and like all of the clients are sending the data to the server and the server is like aggregating it and sending it out, generally what you do is you take uh, like the last message you received and the message before that, and you kind of average them <laughs> and say, that's where probably the, the person is. Um, and that's interpolation. Uh, and that makes for very smooth movement. You don't get those big jumps. But um, I don't know that we can do that here because the whole idea is that rollback and prediction uh, delivers like a ton of accuracy. As far as I know, it is the most accurate method of network synchronization uh, where you cannot really have a situation where, you know, I saw me hit you, but it doesn't really count, right? Um, or I guess it could if the if the delay is big enough and then it rolls back and says it doesn't count or whatever. But um, it is it is really like ensuring that in real world time, you are judged on the positions and actions of all the characters that happened at the same time in real world time, right? Like it's super accurate, but it kind of ties our hands in that we now it's not as easy for us to play around with the difference between what you see and what is. Um, I think that we could though, um, and that's kind of that's kind of what I'm thinking we might have to do. Um, and I think that we could make it so that it only happens that the, okay. So I think there are some hacky things that we could do to eliminate the rubber banding at a slight reduction of perceived accuracy, but I think we could make it so that they only happen in really high latency situations. Um, thus making it so that if you're playing with a bunch of people that you have like a 100 millisecond uh, ping or 150 millisecond ping, like it's totally accurate and whatever, there's a little bit of rubber banding, but it's fine. And then once you're working with someone at, you know, a, a 200 or 300 or 400 or 500, whatever millisecond ping, then uh, these things sort of start to seep in there that will smooth things out so the experience isn't so janky. And the two ideas that I have in mind are, uh, right now we have an input delay. So there are two frames where it gathers your input before it takes action on the input. Uh, I think we could have a reverse delay where uh, we have, um, we get input from the, the remote clients, but we don't take action on it for a couple of frames. Um, and I don't know if we'll have to do that by like 
maybe reducing some of the input delay to make room for it? Or I don't know, like once you're at a high latency, like maybe the fact that it's going to feel like sluggish is okay, so long as it doesn't feel like everything's just bouncing all over the place. So that's the one idea, having a delay on the on the received inputs as well as on our inputs. Um, and the other idea is, again, like interpolation. So we would have a model of the scene as best as we know it, doing full rollback and prediction. And then we have what we're displaying to the user. And in high latency situations, or where the rubber banding is really big enough, like maybe that's how we would tell it's a high latency situation, where if the, if the rubber banding means we're like moving it over a certain number of pixels or adjusting the rotation over a certain amount, we would actually um, keep our internal model completely accurate, but fudge the visual model. Another idea I had, um, which I'm just remembering now, is uh, similar to that, but uh, rather than having these two separate models, we would just, um, I guess it is still two separate models, but if we ran the game at 30 frames per second, uh, or I'm sorry, ran the simulation at 30 frames per second, but displayed the game at 60 frames per second, uh, that gives us an extra frame in between where the model doesn't actually exist, right? So <laughs> it doesn't matter uh, that this in-between position, this you know extra frame that we get in 60 frames a second, it, it doesn't matter what we display there because the simulation doesn't actually have a frame there. So all of the collisions like aren't even checked on that every other frame, right? They're only checked on the simulation. So it would still be perfectly accurate, but we have this extra frame to just kind of fudge things a little bit. Um, and a lot of games like do their network simulations at lower than full frame rate. And I still have to test it to see what it would feel like, but I think it would be fine. I don't know how many of you guys um, uh, have seen my fish game tutorial that I made for Heroic Labs. Uh, that actually runs a simulation at 20 frames per second. It's not using rollback. It's doing um, prediction and correction, not prediction and rollback, which is a different technique, which is also nice and works pretty good for that game. Um, but uh, it's running the, the simulation at 20 frames per second, or not the simulation, I should say, because there isn't a simulation in that technique. There's, it's sending the, the data over the network at 20 frames per second. So you're only receiving updates on the other player's positions at 20 frames per second, even though the whole game is run at 60 frames a second. And it feels fine. It doesn't feel like the, the network is happening at 20 frames a second. Anyway, so those are my three ideas. I'm going to have to go back and watch this video later so I can write those down so I don't forget them. Uh, but that's what I'm thinking for the rubber banding. Uh, Lucas says, interpolation will lose accuracy. You are correct, Lucas. Yet interpolation would look smoother at the cost of accuracy. Um, also remember that Valorant allows you to change the amount of interpolation. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, uh, Iride, Iride, I, you have to tell me how your name is pronounced. Because like, if I'm going to say it, like I'm going to feel stupid every time until I know the truth. <laughs> but yeah, uh, could the input delay depend on the ping? It could. Um, the problem is that the input delay slows you down. And if the problem with the match is that the other guy is slow, you're purposefully making yourself slower uh, to accommodate for their latency. And uh, they might keep their you know, input delay small. So then like you guys are getting a different experience. You're having like where you're pressing to the left and like, oh, it takes so many frames before you start starting to the left and the other guys, you know, having things happen instantly, which I guess, I don't know, is fine. If you're changing it for yourself, like maybe you're saying like, well, I just don't want to see jankiness. I don't care that it might feel worse. I don't know. That's an idea. That's an idea that we could maybe have the, the input delay be configurable by the user or the interpolation configurable by the user. Iride. Okay, Iride, thank you. <laughs> um, so where was I? Man, I got off track. Explaining, chatting, answering questions. Um, so, uh, oh, I was going to explain the, uh, the death spiral. <laughs> That's what I was going to explain. Um, okay, so we have this 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 sliding window act thing, if it's really called that. I think it's called that because you have this sort of idea that you have this window of acknowledgement that is like moving to the to the right with the game. Um, the problem is the higher latency gets, the more data you are sending, right? So if player two is saying, okay, you've last acknowledged frame eight's input, and now I'm on frame twelve, I'm going to send you these frames of input. If the latency gets bigger, that means you're sending even more input. That means like, oh, no, I'm actually sending frame 4 through 12. Oh, latency is so big, I'm sending frame 2 through 12. Oh, latency is even bigger, I'm sending frame 0 through 12. So it's like the worse the connection is, the more data it's sending. 
which creates a death spiral because a worse connection is going to do worse with more data. Um, also, you have to deal with uh, packet size. Uh, so there's this great website about um, implementing network game stuff, Gaffron games. Uh, lots of great articles there by uh, Glenn Fielder, Fieldler, Fiedler. Wow, Fiedler, Fiedler. I'm having a bad name pronunciation day. This guy, um, and he has this great article about um, packets. And uh, if you send packets that are too big, they'll either get lost or split. Um, and so there's kind of like a, a limit of how much you should be sending in each message. Uh, he sort of comes to the conclusion that this is like the upper limit, uh, but that you know maybe you should be sending as little as possible. Maybe for some networks staying below this 120, or you know even below 1,000 or something, whatever. Um, but if your messages get over a certain size, then they start getting lost. And so if in this situation where you keep adding more and more input to be sent, uh, you're sending a single message and it keeps getting bigger, well now, not only you're sending more data on a slow connection, but you're sending a bigger and bigger message, which now has a higher probability of getting lost. Um, so what I ended up implementing was um, uh, putting kind of a limit on how big we can make the messages. The game will actually yell at you. Um, it will measure their size in bytes. Uh, let me find that. Come on, control F, var two bytes. It will measure the size in bytes and output an error in the uh, Godot console if it exceeds a uh, value that we set, because depending on your game, like your messages will just naturally be bigger or smaller how much input you're sending. I have it set to uh, 500 bytes, uh, even though, you know, uh, our friend Gen Glenn Fiedler, Fiedler uh, <laughs> was giving those numbers at like 1,000 or 1,200. Just like experimentally, I was finding if my messages were getting over 500 bytes, uh, like that really was bad. Like it, it really sent us into the death spiral quicker. Um, so I had this, this limit at 500, and then I have it so that uh, it will actually um, only send up to three messages per uh, RPC that it's sending. Um, and which, you know, if you're sending a lot of messages, we have it currently set to have an input buffer of 60, right? <laughs> so in the worst case, it could be sending uh, messages with 60 frames of input. Um, and it would only send up to five RPCs per tick, because if this was set to three, that could mean that in the worst case, you're sending 20 messages every frame, which again is like putting us into the death spiral, so limit it to five. Um, so that helped with these latency situations. Uh, but as soon as I add packet loss, if I add even 1% of packet loss, the whole thing falls apart again. And I did a bunch of debugging, and it seemed like what was happening was we just weren't sending the messages that those particular clients needed. So like the whole scheme that we're using for deciding which messages to send, how many messages, like that whole thing needs to be reworked. Um, and I think that will help with our latency woes and hopefully with our packet loss woes. Um, the packet loss thing is hard to debug because uh, this game uses WebRTC and WebRTC is complicated. Um, when I was doing these simulations, I was like, oh, I'll just run Wireshark and like look at the messages, right? Um, and uh, you can't really do that. <laughs> so um, WebRTC uh, underneath is sending UDP packets, right? Which is great, we want UDP. Uh, but it's not doing just plain vanilla UDP, it's actually doing DTLS, is that the right abbreviation? That's like the SSL version of UDP. So the data is actually all encrypted. So I'm looking at these, these packets and they're all gibberish. I can't do anything with them, I just know that they're happening. Um, but even if we could decrypt the, the UDP, um, it's not just sending like each message in a single UDP packet, no. It's implementing this other protocol which I think is called SCP. I'm just like, I hope I'm not just making up uh, acronyms here, but I think that's what it's called. That's the like transport protocol that's using. Um, yeah, it's for data channels. I think it's called SCP. Is it like STP? It's something S something. I don't know. It's a it's a old protocol. Oh, SCTP. SCTP. Um, so does that? It has this whole stack. It's like really difficult to debug when you're trying to like look at what's actually happening on the wire. So what I propose we do today, if I haven't used up all of our time just chatting, uh, is that we throw together a quick example 
using plain UDP and uh, start messing with latencies and uh, packet loss and see what happens, right? Um, I think we could probably in 15 minutes throw together a quick example. So I'm done talking. I'm, I'm moving on. I'm getting, well, I'm not done talking. Like I'm going to be talking all the time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy to, to, to chat with you guys and whatever. I'm just uh, apologizing that I've taken so long to get to the meat of this thing. Let's close this editor. Uh, close my Steam Tools editor. Let's open up a fresh Godot. What does Iride say? Pipelining the frames? Yeah, basically. Basically. That's, that's, that's um, more or less what the challenge is. And we are going to create a new project. I'm going to call this uh, UDP rollback. All right. So to make this example be as simple as possible, there's going to be no collision, no physics, no winning, no rounds, no score. <laughs> All we are going to do is we're going to have two sprites on the screen that two players control. And let's just whip this up. All right. Make a main scene. We are going to save it. We're going to quick copy the uh, network synchronization add-on. Actually, hang on. I got to make a folder for it. UDP. Oh, hang on. Let me make my terminal be bigger. I should have done that earlier so you guys can actually see what I'm doing here. Make all of the terminals huge. Um, I'm going to make an add-ons folder. We're going to copy our network sync rollback add-on that we have been making through the series of these um, live streams, which will eventually end up on the Godot asset store. All right, we are going to just quick add that to our project. We need to add an auto load, Let's bring in our sync manager object, and we need to enable this plugin, which is going to fail the first time. I need to, uh, before I release this on the Godot asset store, I'm gonna make it like easier to use. <laughs> right now it has this thing where uh, you have to like add it, then restart Godot, and then it will work. Um, so I have to debug that. That's a that's a, a, a release problem, not a while we're doing things on stream problem. All right, saved one modified resource. Sounds good. Where is our main scene here? Uh, we need to make a tiny bit of UI. Um, so let's add a. We don't really need a canvas layer. I'm going to do it anyway, just out of habit here. Canvas layer. We're going to throw, uh, I guess, a panel up here, uh, make it be a, a kind of size. We're going to lay it out in the center. We need to put some buttons on it. So we're gonna put a V box and we'll put our two buttons. Duplicate it, all right. Um, so button number one, I'm gonna say, I am the server. Button number two is gonna say, I am the client. Uh, we are just doing a client and server thing because it's easier to set up than a peer-to-peer -peer thing. A client, a single client and a single server talking to, us, to each other is technically peer-to-peer. -peer. So uh, even though we don't have more peers involved, this is sufficient to do what we need to do. Um, to make it be full rect, I guess. I don't know why I'm even bothering with this. Um, I should just let it be. Just let it be huge or weird or whatever. Um, I don't know, just my my OCD. I don't think I have OCD actually, but my my natural inclination is to perfect all these things that probably don't need perfecting. Okay, <laughs> client server. So we'll have server button client button. Uh, let's attach a script here because it won't let us make any signals until we do. We'll do button pressed server button and the client button. Okay, so I have to quickly remind myself how to do this by taking a quick gander at the Godot documentation. Um, High-level multiplayer, that is a perfectly fine bit of documentation to look at. Uh, the reference might be quicker, but this will work. So this is what we need to happen on our server. We're gonna hard code everything because we don't want to make 
UI or whatever, uh, the server port is going to be, I guess that can be a constant. So const server port, I'm gonna make it a bunch of nines. Max players is gonna be hard coded to two. All right, so that should make our server, our client. We'll do the same thing. I'm going to disconnect on localhost. Oh, come on. Uh, it does need to be a string. One, two, seven, zero, nine, one, server port. All right, so that will get them connected. What next? Um, we should put, we need to hide our panel once the connection is made. So let's get our panel here. Or let's give it a better name. We'll call this connection panel. Unready connection panel equals connection panel. Come on, you can auto complete. You can do it. Why are you not being my friend right now? Auto complete. Hmm. Am I really gonna have to type this? Canvas layer <laughs> connection panel. Oh, on ready var. Ah, ah. It was unhappy with me because I forgot to type var. All right, so now will it autocomplete? There we go. That's my autocomplete. So in both cases, we need to have the connection panel do visible equals false. Connection panel visible equals false. I think we're going to want to know if we are the server, although there's a way to check that on get tree, so that's fine. We don't need to worry about that. Um, we want to start the match. So actually, yeah, maybe what we really need here is a function that's like start game. And we'll move our connection panel junk in here. And we'll need to do sync manager start. I think that is literally everything we're going to need in the main script. And we're just going to throw some sprites onto the scene, which we'll, we'll actually need to make scenes for those. So let's start with scenes. Um, it's going to just be just sprites. Don't need to be fancier. Sprites. This will be player. Um, we're going to do what everyone does and make the Godot icon be the texture of the sprite. And save you. Add a script quick. Uh, before I forget, I need to add this to the network sync group, which tells our sync manager to manage it and do all of the fancy rollback stuff for it. And we're only going to deal with position, so this can be very, very simple. We need to save and load state. So save state. This gets called by our network sync manager uh, every frame to record the state, and then uh, later it will load the state to. Um, when we're doing a rollback. All right, that's all we need because this is super simple. Load state takes a dictionary. This dictionary we just made. Do position equals state position. There we go. Everything should roll back just from that. Uh, and now we need to implement our movement. We're going to use network process rather than physics process because, again, that's what's called by our sync manager um, to simulate everything in our game. It can't be physics process because sometimes network process needs to happen a whole bunch of times for a frame, like when we're rolling back and then rolling forward. Uh, I forget exactly what this takes. Um, it takes a delta and input. Yeah, it takes delta and input, uh, which actually reminds me we are actually going to need to do a, uh, what is it, get input? Uh, I should have left retro tank party open so that I could see the the code but i will just look in the sync manager and see what these things are called so um it's one of these call functions called get local input all right so we need a get local input get local input this is where uh this particular node says what my input is for um to be stored to be stored and synchronized 
um, we're going to make a quick enumeration uh, because on these input dictionaries uh, for sending as few bytes as possible, I've been using numbers as the keys, integers as the keys. So like input key, uh, to make that not confuse me later, we're going to call it player input key. And we're going to say, what was that sound? Holy cow. I don't know if you guys heard that, but there was just a bring sound. Um, position. Fine. Good. Uh, no, not position. Because uh, the input isn't position. The input is, I guess, input vector. We're going to do an input vector. So if our input vector equals vector2, we need to create some quick input maps. Say, there. ah, I created a player underscore one. Get rid of you. Just do player up, player down. Player left, player right. We're going to just make these do the arrow keys super duper fast because we are fast. We are Godot experts or something. I don't know. Are we experts? Probably not. I'm probably not an expert. <laughs> Ah, right, okay. Oh, you know what? I was hitting enter on those two. Uh, okay, left. Uh, down. That's how you know we're, I'm not a Godot expert because I'm hitting enter. Okay, uh, so the input vector. That is the sound of a follow. Thank you, Wasabi Cheetah. <laughs> Thank you. Did you follow? Is that because you followed? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so input vector. And, or no, 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 I'm not doing the input yet. Uh, first, we need to input, get, action, strength. We're going to do uh, x is left and right. So we need to start with player, um, player right. Input, get, action, strength left. I need to do up, down. Down is positive. So again, get action strength. Player down. Minus input. Get action strength. Player up. All right. So that is our input vector. We need to just return that as our input. Should be input vector. Input vector. Bam. We are getting input. <laughs> Thanks, Wasabi Cheetah. Awesome. Representing, representing Twitch there. I need to player input key. Ooh, another follow. Thank you, anonymous bring noise. <laughs> okay, so we're almost there. Uh, the last thing we need to do is we need to predict the input, um, which actually we don't need to. The default implementation of predicting input is just to copy it. That is sufficient in this case. So all we need to do is do the actual movement. So position plus equals input player input key input vector. And we need to multiply it by some speed. I'm just going to say 400. I don't know. That's fine. We'll see if it's fine. Um, and let's throw some players on the main scene and see what happens. Put player number one. Put them over there. And let's check this out. Even though we're not connected, we should still be able to move ourselves. Oh, no, we shouldn't because we haven't started the sync manager. Hmm. Hmm. Why isn't that working? Um, so I pressed the button, which should have started the sync manager, which actually is wrong. We don't want to start the sync manager as soon as... Um, as soon as uh, you press server. We want to start the sync manager once both players are connected. Hey, Gregor Airlines. <laughs> Sabi Cheetah says, welcome to the Godot cult. I mean community. If you have any trouble, just offer your sacrifices. I mean questions to tutorials on YouTube and also the Godot Discord. <laughs> Godot is a great community. I've been involved in a lot of open source communities. I've been doing open source since the late 90s, which makes me old, I think. Maybe. I feel young. I'm not that old. Not, not objectively, but in computer years. Um, and I've been a part of a lot of open source communities in that time. 
and Godot is a really nice one, a really nice one, really great people. Uh, the maintainers are super responsive. I guess technically I'm one of the maintainers. I maintain uh, the WebXR support in Godot, um, which is not a very popular part of Godot, but um, no, it's a great community. Anyway, um, so like I was just saying, we need to not actually start the sync manager right away. We need to uh, connect to some signals, which I believe are on the tree, on the scene tree. Um, scene tree, yep, on the scene tree. So let's say get tree connect. Um, we are going to do peer connect and connected to server. I think that's what we need. So self, um, unless peer connected happens always, but we'll we'll find that out in a second. On peer connected, actually, we only need to start the sync manager on the server. So perfect. On peer connected, um, will totally work. So func uh, on network peer connected. Don't know if it takes any arguments, does it? It probably takes a peer ID. It does. It takes a peer ID. Um, peer ID int. All right. Um, and then once this starts, uh, then our things should start working. Let's just let's just start it like right away, even though this is bad. But just so we can make sure that our our little um, input code is working. So we'll start the sync manager. It is erroring. Start should be called on the host. Ha <laughs> Okay, so we can't do that to test. All right, we can only test. In Retro Tank Party, I have a way to make like fake network connections so that we can actually test um, without for real connecting, but whatever. We'll for real connect. Say server. We will start another Godot over here. We'll say client. We should now be connected. I don't know why this panel didn't disappear. What am I messing up? Let's go look as always, in the debug thing here and see what I'm doing. Return to value, delta is never used. I pressed the buttons though. Oh, because I need to call start game. Start game. Actually, no, because we're not really starting the game. Let's undo a thing I did a second ago. We'll just put this here. Take two. Server and it disappeared, yay! And client and okay, delaying host start by zero frames, so that means the host actually started. Now, why? Ooh, okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, I know what my error was. Um, I should have been multiplying speed by delta or giving a much smaller value because 400 pixels per frame is way too much. 400 pixels per second is actually a reasonable amount. Um, how many pixels per frame, if we're going to think about this in frames instead of time? Two pixels? Two pixels per frame? See how that looks. Hey, that's a little better. Um, let's make it a little faster because that just feels sluggish. We'll say four. I shouldn't have closed the window because now I have to reopen everything again to see what my change looks like. Server, client. All right. So uh, we are not doing the necessary setup on these players for them to be actually synchronized here. There's a tiny bit of setup we have to do. We have to tell um, Godot which peer owns which player. So here we'll we'll name um, this one server player and this one client player and um, we need to do a little bit of setup. I guess we're capable of doing the setup as soon as we've connected. So I guess we do need to connect. Okay, on network peer connected, we need to connect on connected to server. And I see Chad is moving over there. I will I will take a peek in a second after I get my last thought out here. Connect no server something? No? 
<laughs> Come on, autocomplete. Connected to server. There we go. So, unconnected to server. All right, so what's going on in chat? Wasabi Chi got into open source software just a couple years ago. Awesome. Welcome to the open source world. Gregor Airlines, I've only done a small contribution to an open source project so far, and it happens to be Godot. Awesome. That's great. How come you don't use Delta? Isn't frame timing inconsistent? I know this is a test project, but still. Okay, so we can use Delta. 100% we could. It's actually a liability when using uh, rollback and prediction, though, because um, rollback and prediction isn't really based on time. It's based on frames. And we could use time, and it would probably be fine, but floating point numbers will sometimes give different results on two different systems. And we need for all of the clients to actually be deterministic. So we do one thing, we, we send one set of inputs to this client, we send the same set of inputs to the other client, the exact same thing should happen down to like the binary value of each of those position numbers. Um, so we could use delta, and it would probably be fine. But the more correct thing to do when you're doing rollback and prediction is to base everything on frames rather than time. Or if you are going to use time and be multiplying by times, you should use deterministic math, which isn't floating point numbers, <laughs> at least in our case. Um, you can make floating point numbers be deterministic in a couple of situations. If you use a soft float library, if you compile your uh, binary to use the IEEE version of floats only and disable any math optimizations, or if you are using the exact same binary on the exact same uh, system and architecture and operating system. <laughs> In that case, the floating point math will come out the same on both. But um, yeah, that was way too long of an answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we want to avoid using using time uh, is the short is the short answer. All right, uh, on connected to server. Do we get a peer ID here? Uh, connected to server. We might not. I'm not sure. On connected to server. Let's just do that, and I will. Um, quick check the help here. We're going to look for a scene tree and connected to server. Okay, no arguments. Emitted whenever a scene tree is network peer six successfully connected. Only emitted on clients. Okay. Uh, I also want to know if network peer connected is only emitted emitted whenever the scene tree's network peer connects to a new peer. The ID is a peer. It connects to notify when other clients connect the same server. Oh, on connected server, client also receives a signal for this server. Okay, never mind. We didn't need to implement that. We could have stuck with just the one. Okay, so on peer connected is sufficient because it gets called on both client and server. If we are get tree get uh, or is network server, ah, is network server. We start the sync manager, and that's because we need to do a synchronized start where we're accounting for the latency of both sides. Oh, we also need to add all of the peers. So sync manager add peer, Eep. peer ID, and we need to, uh, before we do this, we need to grab our server player. Let's do server player set network master one. One is always the server. Uh, and the other one, man, this is ugly. This is a demo project, but this code is ugly. Um, so if we are the network server, then we set network master for the other player by using the peer ID that we were just passed. And if we are that, oh, not server, sorry, client player. And if we're client player set network master, we do get tree get unique network ID. Oh my gosh. I think that this is enough to make this work. We'll find out. We'll find out in a moment. Server. Close you. Restart you. Wait, where's my other? Oh, they're on top of each other. OK. Ah, it's not working. Ooh, but we got an error. Errors are helpful. Cannot get 
index zero. Oh, right. We have to assume that the input could be empty and do a default value, which will just be vector two zero. All right. What's going on in chat here? Oh, awesome. <laughs> Gregor, I'm, I'm, I am uh, uh, glad that that answer was helpful to you, if a little long-winded. <laughs> um, Wasabi Cheetah on Manjaro is my main OS. Oh, awesome. And Ubuntu is your backup. Rockin', rockin' two Linux distros there. <laughs> yeah, I'm also using Ubuntu. Uh, probably hard to tell because I use a non-standard window manager, which I've used since like, I don't know, 2001. And I just like can't use a computer any other way at this point. I'm just, you get stuck in your ways. Um, okay. Uh, so let's try this. I should add that multi-run extension here because this is getting time consuming, pressing all these buttons. Hey, there we go. Rollback and prediction. It is real choppy. Even though we're like on the same you know, machine here and everything. Um, that's interesting. Let me, let me check uh, the different settings that we've got and see, uh, see what's happening. But I'm happy that we got our example working. <laughs> Did that take 15 minutes? Uh, take more like 25 minutes. Um, let's do a couple of things really quick. I am going to make a git repo for this because I cannot exist without git. Let's make a git repo. Uh, I'm going to copy the git ignore that I use for all my projects and edit it because this probably has some retro tank party specific stuff in it. Yeah, this game, this test game is not going to Steam. Uh, we don't need the Steam related stuff there. Status, git add. Okay, so super simple start. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got that set up. Uh, I'm going to take a peek. Oh, I want to add um, the debug tool that comes with our add-on that we've been working on, the sync debugger. To use that, I need to add an action. Let me go figure out what that action is, because I always forget the names of everything. Sync debug. So we're going to add a new input map action called sync debug. We're going to bind it to the F11 key. We are going to move these two um, little icons. They're not on top of each other. And I should add that multi-run thing. It is so annoying to have to quit and start this every time. Um, I don't know. Is that too much of a waste of time? I don't think so. I think we can do it. I think we can do it. It will make it will make me feel slightly better. <laughs> so I'm going to copy the multi-run add-on to this project. Uh, no, I'm in the wrong folder. OK, UDP. And why is my font not ginormous anymore? Did I like close the terminal window? Just let me just poke around here. No. Oh, well, I don't know. Whatever. Um, we're gonna enable that multi-run plugin, which I was expecting to see right here. What did I do? Um. Okay, sorry. I'm just having brain lapses because I'm on stream and I start to type stupid things and do stupid things when everyone's looking at me. Okay, so enable multi-run. And then we need to do a quick thing with command line arguments, um, which will be, uh, what is that? OS get command line args, beautiful. We'll say, uh, well, let's just grab these. We'll say command line, command line args. And we'll say if server in command line args, then we'll just press the server button. And just else. Yeah, we'll just do else. We don't need to get fancy. Then press the client button. 
And we'll go configure this add-on to uh, do that, multi-run. So we are going to start two, uh, add custom args. The first window will have server, and the other window will have nothing. That looks good to me. Let's test it out. So here we go. This one should be the server. This one should be the client. It is confusing having them on top of each other, so let's just move them out. Um, we'll put the second one down here. So there we go. Why on earth are we getting so much artifacts from this little thing? Huh. Well, let's hit F11. And I guess we have to do it on both because it doesn't give our own statistics. Wow, there's just an enormous amount of lag. Oh, <laughs> I uh, left the um, I left the latency that we had turned on when we were testing earlier. I left that on. I left that turned on. Let me turn that off. Let's uh, let's uh, get that turned off, and we'll see how the how the game adjusts to it. We should see the ping drop or the RTT. It's listed as RTT here. Oop, I gotta type my root password. Oh, look at that remote, negative remote lag. Wow, this client did not adjust well. Holy cow, so this client adjusted perfect. This client has gone out of control. I, I think synchronization was lost on that client. Wow, why did it do so badly? Okay, so another thing we need to add really quick is we need to add uh, some messages uh, when there is an error. And we're gonna do that in the most simplistic way possible by putting a giant label on the uh, top of the screen here. Call it message label. I'm going to move it to our, or you know what? We'll just we'll do center top, top center, top wide. All right, and we are going to grab a variable for that message label, message label. We need to bind to a new signal. This will be on the sync manager connect, and this is sync error self on sync manager sync error and we will put that in our label sync error it passes a message string and we'll do message label text equals message cool What's going on? Oh, you were you're totally right, Rita. It's, if it wasn't for the delay between what I'm doing here and it appearing on YouTube, you would have you would have totally uh, caught that before me. <laughs> thanks for the help. Thanks for keeping an eye. All right. Um, so that should work. Everything is closed. Let's jump over here. I guess I want synchronization to be lost just so I can um, see that uh, that that worked. Oh, look at that. So okay, with no delay. No artifacts. We're good. We'll turn on the debug overlays on both of them. And uh, yeah, that's looking good. The advantage seems to be hopping around a little bit more than I would be expecting it to. Oh, now it's kind of stabilized. Now it's totally stabilized. So to explain these numbers a little bit, uh, remote lag or local lag is the, uh, this peer is calculating that the, um, or how does this work? I always get confused. It has to do with how many frames that we think they are predicting for us and how many frames we think we're predicting for them. Or actually, we know exactly how many frames we're predicting for them. Uh, let me look in the code so I can, so I can tell you guys the right, the right direction that this goes. I'll look in the, the sync manager and I'll see how these are calculated. Um, or I'll cheat even more. I'll look at what my comment is. Okay, number of frames the remote is predicting for us. So that's remote lag. All right. So local lag is how many frames we are predicting for this other peer and remote lag is how many frames we think they are predicting for us which is amazingly accurate uh under reasonable size latencies <laughs> if the latency is like uh 50 to 100 milliseconds that being like 100 to 200 millisecond ping uh you can watch these two peers and see that they are guessing the right number of prediction frames for the other like perfectly you get that up to 200 milliseconds and it's just like wackiness it'll be saying like they're predicting they'll both think that they're predicting like 30 frames for the other and it's like no you're not that's not what's happening um but uh anyway so 
what was I going to do after this? Uh, so we knew why the lag was happening. Uh, we are sending pure UDP packets, which means we can start looking at this in Wireshark, which will be interesting. Um, and uh, which piece of this should we work on first? We have improving reliability in general with packet loss, and we have uh, the kind of resyncing when synchronization is completely lost. Um, I think I want to look at packet loss first. Let me grab uh, the code to introduce some packet loss. And we'll start super modestly. We'll add like a, a 50 uh, millisecond. Oh, no, or not. <laughs> I copy and pasted without changing it. Um, oh, oh. There's, I wonder if the lag I'm introducing, uh, Uride says the webcam is starting to lag. I wonder if the lag I'm introducing is affecting the stream. I didn't even think about that. Um, let's, um, okay, so here's a message. I got to move that over a little bit. Um, okay, first let me set this to what I'm, no, no, no. First let me remove this. I'm going to remove it. I'm going to go take a peek in OBS. Am I still going? You guys still hearing me? OBS is like locked. Uh, I guess let me know if, if you're not actually seeing me. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, check on my phone if I'm still coming through. I might need to quit OBS and restart. Oh, I'm I'm back. I'm back in business. You guys are seeing me. Awesome. That's beautiful. Uh, cool. Um, if the lag I'm introducing is going to break the stream, then the whole premise of this stream is in trouble. Although it didn't happen earlier. Like, I guess, okay, so this was a really extreme delay and a really, like, not extreme packet loss, but, like, you know, more than zero. You know... Am I going to need to like start a VM and then run the game in a VM so that it can't affect my normal network traffic? I mean, it shouldn't really though, right? Because we're, we're doing stuff on the loopback interface. Um, okay, so, so Gregor Airlines, Iride, they're saying it just lagged a little bit, but they're good. My OBS is still like totally locked up, so I can't even look in there. Um, if you guys are still seeing it, that's fantastic. I'm just not going to touch OBS. Uh, I will like force quit it when, when the stream comes to an end. Um, I'm a little afraid to, afraid to introduce delay here, though. Um, hmm. We'll try it. We'll try it. And if the stream gets screwed up again when I add some packet loss, then, uh, then we'll rethink this and maybe do something else or I'll start screwing around with VMs. Um, so first things first. The synchronization loss message was um, not great. It was uh, too far over. We're not going to do, let's do top center and reduce this, uh, the size of this. And top center, and we're going to like crank up the font. Um, that's custom styles, I think. No, custom fonts. Yes. Um, do I have to actually put in a font to just change the size? I've never just like wanted to use the default font before. Uh, I'm always putting in a font. Um, let's just see if this does anything. I'll add some text. It does not. Okay, so let's grab the font for Metro Tank Party really quick. Um, uh, where is it? Monogram, monogram extended, TTF. Let's grab that. Need to make some new font data here. And there we go. And let's align this center and really crank this up. Okay, that's, that's nice. And we're going to uh, add sync lost to the front of that and that's good 
uh, Irita says, is there a way you can simulate delay or packet loss in Godot? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I've read through quite a bit of the network code, and I don't recall seeing anything like that. Um, I'm doing it at the system level here. I think if this really does screw things up, uh, a VM I think is probably the best answer. I can have like a, an Ubuntu VM open in this window and like run the game there. I could like mount my folder over and I don't know. But who knows? Who knows? Maybe that was just random like things and wasn't related to what I'm doing. Uh, because I feel like it shouldn't be because I'm messing with the loopback device, which I shouldn't be streaming over unless like OBS or some other tool uses it internally. Uh, cold coffee. I need like a, a coffee machine or a, a microwave here or something so I can heat up my coffee as the stream goes on. I'm not a big fan of cold coffee. Anyway, um, let's, let's do this. Let's uh, launch our game. Let's let's cross our fingers. Ooh, that was kind of nice. Um, turn on some debug overlays, and let's introduce a light amount of packet loss. 50 milliseconds delay, 1% packet loss. We'll watch the output here. So the lag is good. Oh. Oh, we totally lost sync. Just like, bam, just like lost it in a second. The advantage like spiked and it went away. Uh, I didn't quite catch what the advantage was um, leading up to that. I'm starting to feel like I need a reset button. Let's add a quick reset button to this game so I don't have to, uh, I don't have to keep starting it over when I'm not making code changes. Put it in the bottom right. We'll call it reset. I guess I have to redo the anchors here. Bottom right. And we will connect to the pressed signal. And we need to know if we are the server or the client, although we might be disconnected. So I guess we do need to keep a variable that says is server. And when we press here, we'll set is server equals to true, is server equals to false, and reset. Um, what is the cleanest way to reset this? Because we want to reset everything to its original positions. You know what? We can just reload the scene. Screw this is server stuff. We'll just reload the whole scene. And it will do what it's going to do. Um, and I forget how to do that. <laughs> uh, reload current scene. Bam. OK. Let's see if that works. All right. OK, so the packet loss is still in there. We're seeing a bunch of rollbacks. Are you guys still seeing me, by the way? Like, I introduced this latency and this um, packet loss, and let me know if, if I've disappeared. We're seeing a bunch of rollbacks, a modest amount of rollbacks. Wow. So RetroTank Party does not handle even 1% latency. It would, it would totally crash. Um, let's try introducing 2.5% latency which is still like a sort of internet normal amount of latency. Our game should support or latency packet loss. Our game should support that much packet loss. It should be OK. Wow, OK, so this version is holding up a lot better than Retro Tank Party um, using the same settings. And I wonder if that's just the switch to UDP, like the lower complexity. Ah, oh, thanks, Iride and Gregor. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad it's working good for you. Um, all right, let's let's really step this up. Let's do like 200 milliseconds with a packet loss of 2.5. Okay, we have a huge local lag spike, but it's kind of normalized. These are slowly reaching. Uh, they should reach an equilibrium. The way the code is, the local and remote lag on both clients should be attempting to attain the same value. And it's pretty unstable. 
<laughs> Look at this one. 30, 31, 51, 70. Oh, we lost sync. Interesting. Okay. So let's look at um, let's look at exactly what is happening here. I had some debug code that I had in here yesterday that I removed right before the stream because I wanted to or not yeah, it was in here because I just copied this for Metro Tank Party. Um, which let me just go look in, in Git in Retro Tank Party so I can see what that debug code was and I can just bring it back. Uh, disable some debug messages. Yeah, these two things. These two things. I will actually just get a patch for this um, for this commit hash and apply it to the other project. So git diff. Oh come on! I copied that. I clearly copied and pasted that. And you didn't get it? Okay. Well, we'll try uh, grabbing it from here. So this commit hash git diff. Ah. There we go tilde one dot dot same git commit hash again. That is our nice little patch. We're going to drop it in our UDP project patch. And we'll go over to our UDP project and just apply that patch. And I think we have to reverse it. So that is patch. All right. So that just applied these debug changes. And I guess I didn't bring in these other changes. So let me make this into two commits here. Um, let's add the add-ons multi-run and the main changes and the project changes. Let's just quick save here just in case there was anything else. Nope. And we'll make this into one commit. So this will be um, not a fix up a debug and some little things. And then the next change will add these debugging messages back. Uh, I wanted them to be in separate commits so that I could revert this later. Temp add some debug messages. I can just in a single git command like revert that if I need to. And let's watch our debug messages. I can't use the multi-run button because the console messages won't go anywhere. So we'll do this the slow way. What? Why aren't you giving me the option to like press things? Oh, because I put that else in there. Ah, uh, ah, uh, terrible thinking. L if we'll say client in command line args. It wasn't seeing server, so it was saying I'm the client, but I need to be able to choose. So that's going to change our configuration here a little bit for multi-run. Uh, that one will say client. This one will say server. Okay, sorted. Um, We'll start this one as the server and this one as the client. We can move around. We have all this latency. Oh, and it lost it right away. OK, um, let's make this more mild. I don't want to lose sync immediately. Yeah. Um, but we should be able to get some information from the debug output. All right, so uh, the messages that we added were this sending six RPCs and then a list of what ticks are, what input ticks are available in that set of RPCs. So the sending RPCs happens on each frame. Um, and I wanted to see the sync lost message. I actually don't see any sync lost message on this side. Maybe synchronization was lost on the other side, and then we disconnected. So let's go take a look on this side. OK. Network sync lost. Retired in, in incomplete input frame uh, 119. So what that means is that this client still needed input, frame, input for input frame 119 from this client and didn't receive it and used up its whole buffer and had no choice but to quit because it would be unable to um, roll back sufficiently if that input ever came. Um, and if we look at what we are sending here, when was the last time we sent frame 119? <laughs> A long, long time ago. Ooh, discarding message from the future. That's a message I don't see very often. 
uh, but definitely possible when we were doing packet loss. Um, discarding message from a future from the future. What is the case that does that? Uh, sync manager. Discarding message from the future. Whoa, that really shouldn't happen. Okay, so this message is output when the first tick in a collection of messages is greater than our current input tick plus the max buffer size. And the max buffer size is 60. So we received input 60 frames in the future? That's nuts. So I guess that could happen in what situations? So we're imagining we are 60 frames behind. Our input is 60 frames behind their input. I guess if we skipped way too many ticks. Uh, so there's a thing in here that will skip ticks if we get too out of sync, which is another thing that behaves really badly uh, when we start to lose packets. So were we skipping a lot of frames? We were at the end for sure. I saw some messages here that we were skipping lots of frames, but we weren't skipping lots of frames. Yeah, holy cow, skipping 158 local ticks to adjust for peer advantage. That shouldn't be possible. We need some kind of limiter on how many ticks we skip um, because 158 frames is never, it's never a good idea. I mean, I guess, okay, maybe not never. When we implement the thing that tries to resync in the case of catastrophic desyncing, uh, maybe we will want to wait for that long, but like not when we're just skipping ticks to try and resync ourselves. Yeah, 129 ticks. Okay, so what happened right before, ah, uh, I'll put overflow. So I guess I don't know. I don't know exactly what was happening before here. But I think, I think you know where we need to address this. So earlier I was talking about how we were breaking up our messages. Um, this has an interesting side effect that we may stop sending an old message that the other peer still needs, which is definitely part of what happened here. So this needed input from frame 119. We stopped sending frame 119 a long time ago. Like, uh, so frame 119 would have been sent. Um, wow, we're receiving these huge like numbers in the future when we're still sending, you know, these low messages. Anyway, I think I think uh, the problem is there's some old frame we're not receiving. And that is screwing up our calculation for skipping ticks. And that is what is causing us to eventually lose synchronization. And so we need to come up with a smarter algorithm. Oh, man, we're running out of time. I mean, not running, running out of time. We have 20 minutes. <laughs> and uh, uh, we haven't gotten down to like serious coding yet. Um, OK, guys, two things. I need to run to the bathroom really quick. I'll be back in a minute. And then we're going to try to solve just this one little problem before we end the stream in the next, you know, 20, 25 minutes that we have left. All right. Oh, but I can't even like disable my screen while I'm gone because OBS is like totally gone out to lunch here. All right. So you guys get to watch me walk out the door because <laughs> I can't change the screen. I'll be back so fast. All right, guys.
Okay. So let's find this code <laughs> that is uh, sending that is splitting up the messages and sending it. I believe it's like get messages for peer or something like that. Let's filter here. Get input messages for peer. All right, this method is overly complex. Probably should be broken up into a class um, so that we can make it smarter and uh, maybe even have like multiple swappable strategies because I, I could imagine. Um, you know, wanting to, to tune this for a particular game. Um, but the way that this is working currently is we're given a peer, um, disable max RPCs. So yeah, this is just a dumb hack I introduced, uh, which will uh, just send all the RPCs, even though we're trying to limit them in like rare cases. We're like, if synchronization is lost, well, ah, just send everything. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> a dumb strategy. Uh, but anyway, so we're given a peer. We are checking to see if we have uh, the next tick that they are requesting. Or actually, no. So what we're, what we're trying to figure out, actually, is what is the index in our input buffer for the next tick that they are requesting? If it's so old that we no longer have it in the input buffer, we just say, OK, well, all we can send is the beginning of our input buffer on. We are limiting the max number of messages that we are sending. So rather than starting all the way back at uh, the next tick they're requesting, we're actually moving forward so that we're only sending this max number of messages. Because like I said, to avoid this death spiral, we are limiting that. And I think that this is essentially what's causing the problem that we saw right now, where those two clients went out of sync. Um, because we are not going all the way back to the next tick that they need uh, because we're trying to limit the messages that we're sending. And so I think we need some new kind of strategy where we limit the number of messages that we're sending, but we still occasionally send the oldest input. Um, because if we just keep sending newer input, and all of that old input just got lost due to packet loss or packet corruption or whatever, uh, then we're just we're screwed. So I'm thinking we need some kind of strategy. So okay, let's let's think about how this works. Great, great. So every frame we have a new piece of input added to our list of input that we're sending. So uh, you know we have. Uh, I don't know, start frame 10, 9, 8, 7. So it's frame 10, so we add frame 10, but we still have frame 9, 8, and 7. And then way back here, we'll say 2, some dots. This is the last, uh, this is the, the frame that the peer says they need next. So this is the, the next frame that uh, we haven't gotten an act for, that they haven't acknowledged receiving. So every frame, we're adding a new one to the top. So the next frame, we're adding, OK, frame 11 to uh, the top of the set of the input that we need to send. And we are breaking our input up into chunks when we are sending it to, so again, avoid that death spiral. So what we have happening is that the top sort of package of data will keep sort of, uh, it will keep repeating these first sets of inputs uh, for a while until they fall onto the second page, and then those will repeat until they fall onto the last page. So we kind of have these pages of input. And the way it's set up now is we are sending so many of the most recent pages, but eventually we stop sending the oldest pages. And what I think we need to do is just like occasionally send the old pages too. So we have the new pages, we have the old pages. We want to always send the top one because it has the newest data. Uh, we likely want to send the second one also, but like we can kind of alternate between these sort of end and middle ones so that we don't completely avoid that old input. Now, how are we going to do that? Because from it's not like we can have a single set and, um, you know, say we'll send this many this frame and this frame many next frame because the set is actually always changing. Every single frame, the set changes because it gets bigger up here and it pushes more down there. Maybe we need to count from the bottom rather than counting from the top. So 
Hmm. The reason we're counting from the top now is because we want the newest input to always be paired with like some nearby input. It would really suck if we were sending like just one here and then like three on the next one because we're not getting any redundancy on the most important message. Uh, we want some redundancy on the most important message. Do we need to count in both directions? And then take a little bit from the top and a little bit from the bottom? Maybe that's what we got to do. I guess that risks missing things in the middle, but the middle quickly becomes the bottom once things get acknowledged, right? So, okay, what if we do what we're doing and we send the most recent, let's say, one, two, three frames, and then we also build up a set of messages from the bottom up and send the oldest one, two, three frames, because we're sending six right now, right? So uh, this math works for our current configuration of sending six RPCs every, every frame. So we get kind of a mix of old and new, because until they act that old stuff, like that stuff's a liability. That's what's going to make us lose synchronization, is that old stuff not getting through. So this is why I think we need a class here. Um, because now we're managing like two queues, which means we'll probably be breaking this up into separate methods, and it'd be nice to have those like segregated completely. Um, since we only have a little bit of time, let's see how we can do it without creating a new class. So we'll build these two sets of messages. We're gonna start there's another thing we need to do here too, which is to not retire ticks that um, that we know other peers need. That's a whole other part of this. Okay, so if we don't have the tick they requested, like we can't send it anyway. So we need to retain, okay. So there's two things we need to do. Uh, let me add this to a to-do or something. We need to retain all input frames that are needed by some peer. And we need to send a half new input frames and half old input frames. And those might overlap, and there's probably some algorithm to avoid sending overlapping ones. I guess that would be if the number of items in the, any of the sets is um, greater than the total size of uh, <laughs> if the total number size of frames that we have available that we're that we're thinking about sending to this client. Okay, so let's address, um, because this is math is in here, like we need to address that problem first. Okay, so we need a method to tell us, do any peers still need a particular tick? Um, so that would be like, is tick needed by, or do, can we have something that just sort of like updates a kind of like a, a low water value. Um, so say var. Um, so be like oldest. Uh, what are we calling the the local variable here? So next tick requested. So this will be minimum minimum next tick requested int and when we are updating our uh, next tick requested we will update that value um, to update our global minimum next tick requested 
and says would be update next tick quest in can we get a way can't is there a way to get that value without looping through all of them i don't think there is don't think there is so let's say the current client that we're communicating with, they have the lowest value presently, and then we update this. Can we just take their value, or do we have to know them all? I think we have to know them all, so we're going to loop. We're going to loop, um, but we're only going to loop over this each time we receive a packet, as opposed to when would the other time be? i to make sure I'm making the right optimization here. Um, the other time would be when determining which ticks to send. Which of those happens less frequently? I think when we're determining what ticks to send. So this is a bad idea. Okay. Yeah, because we're going to receive more ticks than we are going to send because in any case where we have more than one peer, we're always going to be receiving more. So okay, let's get rid of this minimum tick thing. That was a bad idea. We are going to add a method to calculate the the oldest tick or wait maybe we still want to keep it we still want to keep this variable here but we're just not going to calculate it there we're going to calculate it when we are starting when we are getting our input to send uh, which is over in physics process so we are get or create input frame right here this is where we want to do it. So we're going to say uh, minimum next tick requested. Um, yeah, I'm going to do this as a method. So get, or I'll say calculate, calculate minimum, minimum next tick requested. And we will implement that method. Uh, up here, I guess, because I like to put things kind of in vaguely the order that they happen. Um, calculate minimum next tick requested. It's going to return an integer. Say var. Uh, da, 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 da. We can't set it to zero because we're looking for a minimum. So this would be, I don't know. Um, result will have to equal what the first peers um but peer is a dictionary okay <laughs> peers equals or um say peer list equals peers values we'll say um min or result int equals i guess we'll do this as a to get our types gotta have types peer list zero um, or no, hang on, we'll, we'll pop it from the front, pop front, uh, minimum, uh, minimum, or no, next tick requested, next, is it local tick requested? Jeez. Next local tick requested, next local tick requested, next local tick requested, and then we'll loop over the rest of the peers, peer in peer list, we'll say result equals the smaller value between result and peer next local tick requested, and we will return the result. Okay, so we calculate that. So we need to make sure we do not trash uh, any input frames below that this minimum, and we are trashing input frames in the get or create input frame method. Get or create input frame. That is here where we are retiring old input frames. So um, so the way this is working is it is saying if there are ticks below 
if the if the ticks from the beginning of the buffer up to our current tick are greater than the max buffer size, which is 60 in this case, then we start removing um, ticks from the bottom, and we just need to make sure that we don't go so far back as to get below that minimum. So we need to say if input frame oops input frame to input frame to retire dot tick I think is greater than or no so picturing this in my brain so we have these ticks a certain set of them is too low some could be older so we're slowly getting up no they can't be older because this is a minimum um, if this tick is lower than or equal to our minimum next tick requested then we just bail we can't remove any ticks because we've already gotten up to the minimum but does that should we even loop um, maybe we should just be checking if the input buffer start tick is lower than the next tick minimum next tick no okay so the minimum next tick requested isn't a minimum in that sense oh i'm twisting my brain up in knots here it's a minimum in the sense that we can remove all the ticks until we get to it so if input frame to retire is greater than or equal to the next move. Okay, so we can have ticks below it. So we'll say the minimum that we need to save for clients is five. We're down at two. It's cool to remove two. We can remove two. We can remove three. We can move four, but we can't remove five. Okay. Input frame to retire tick greater than or equal to minimum tick requested. Then we can't do it. Then we exit. Okay, so that will make sure we never discard a tick that we've recorded another peer as needing. That can be a problem A problem if uh, that peer is just never going to respond if they are done. <laughs> then this buffer will grow forever, we'll use up all our memory and, and crash. Uh, so we do need some kind of safeguard. Um, which, where will we install that? Um, I guess here, um, to do um because this is where we'd be refusing to remove it so it'd be like add some kind of safeguard if we have way too many ticks which um let's actually add that now let's add that now uh, we'll say if uh input buffer uh is it not underscore input input buffer size is greater than let's say three times the max max buffer size times three then we will return a fatal error um, which will be something like uh, holding uh, input buffer input buffer too large um, saving input for minimum minimum tick and then we'll I'll put the value so we can get an idea of how far behind we are here okay so we'll say safeguard if we add way too many ticks how are we doing on time ah one minute okay can we can we can we finish this can we finish this um So this is our get input messages for peer. All right, we don't need to worry about this because now no matter what, or no, we don't need to worry about this because now no matter what, we will always have the requested uh, input in the buffer. So we've made sure it's there. So bam, we don't need that. Um, only send a certain amount of messages in RPCs per tick. So we need to build up a list at the starting at the top and a list starting at the bottom. Um, and then we need to break them up into fixed size chunks here. Uh, I don't think I could get this done in a minute or two. So, um, 
so yeah I'm sorry guys I don't think I can get anything productive done and just like I, I, I going over five minutes is fine I go over five minutes all the time <laughs> but in five minutes I don't know that I can make this work I don't know that I can make this work um okay here's what I'll do instead here's what I'll do I'll explain to you guys what my plan is for this and then uh, uh, I will probably be working on it between now and the next stream uh, and then we will pick up with whatever is still left to do next week. And I'm really sorry that we didn't get anything cool and, and, and interesting implemented today. I just, you guys are so interesting. I was just talking to you the whole time. I, uh, all right. So what I think I am going to do is I'm going to split out this whole, like get input messages for peer thing to its own class. And basically the sync manager is going to say, Hey, here's the peer I have you figure out what messages I'm supposed to send and then just return them. And this new class will be able to build up both of our lists, our, our starting from the top list and our starting from the bottom list, and then split them in half and throw them back. Um, and that will maybe, will maybe very theoretically handle the problem where we're still sending messages, where messages are still being received, but we're not sending the messages that that peer needs. Um, I think we can still get into trouble where, uh, like I was saying before, we lose sync and then just give up where maybe if we just waited an extra, like, I don't know, 100 milliseconds or something, we'd be able to resync or something. Uh, so that uh, still needs to be implemented. But like immediately the next thing, the way that I'm going to handle this is I'm going to split this whole thing into a class that can have a whole bunch of methods and figure all this stuff out itself. I also... I was thinking about this as I was implementing that last bit of code where I was uh, retiring frames from the input buffer uh, or choosing not to retire frames from the input buffer. Uh, maybe we need to keep two separate buffers. Like, because um, we're keeping all these old frames on the input buffer because some other peer needs them, but we don't need the whole input frame because an input frame contains not just our input, but it also contains the input for all the other players. So like an input buffer frame has a list of players and that contains input for player for all of the players in the match. Um, we don't need to retain uh, the other player's inputs. We just need to retain our inputs because that's what needs to get sent out. So maybe um, what we should actually have is an input buffer that has all the input and then like an input to send buffer, which has all of our input, uh, which I think could lead to some other efficiencies, not just this memory thing, uh, where we're not saving memory that we're actually never going to use. But there are like some conversions that are done to input frames before they are sent. You can see that uh, a little bit in here. At least I think so in here. Maybe it was done somewhere else. Buffer has yeah. yeah, here we go. Map input paths. So there's this little bit of mapping that we do uh, to a frame before we send it out. And the way we have it now... Uh, and this is mapping just for sending. Like this mapping um, exists to make the, the the frames that we're sending smaller over the wire. Uh, the frames as we use them in memory are like, you know, just the plain thing. Um, so if we have an input to send buffer, we could actually keep them in the buffer already like mapped and converted to the to the state that they need to be to send over the wire. And then that could avoid us having to actually do this to the same sets of input like over and over and over and over again. Uh, so it'd be a slight, you know, memory advantage, a slight CPU advantage to having separate buffers. So maybe I'll implement that as well. <sighs> well, anyway, <laughs> th thanks everyone for coming. It was great chatting with all of you. Um, you know, I, I keep thinking I should do longer streams because <laughs> I get to chatting and then uh, uh, I end up not accomplishing really as much as I hope. But um, Please come next time. <laughs> I will. I will uh, make a concerted effort to do more hacking and 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 less uh, introductory stuff. I think for the next stream, and we can try and take this uh, uh, to the next level, where once we have handling the the uh, uh, latency and packet loss stuff better, uh, the next thing is trying to deal with the rubber banding and and those artifacts. Because if we can make this synchronization method work well over crappy connections. And we can make the rubber banding and like weird artifacts acceptable, then this is actually going to stay in the game. If we can't, well, <laughs> we're going to have to um, 
we're going to then have to address, uh, uh, look at a different network synchronization method to increase accuracy, but without the cost of making sync hard to keep or, uh, 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 you know, making it perform badly for, for poor connections. So that's the future. That's what's coming. I think I should still be streaming at the same time uh, next week, Friday. The week after that, I, I think I have to change the time because my daughters are going to be in swim lessons and I need to go help with swim lessons. Uh, but anyway, that is it. <laughs> Thanks every for, everyone for watching. Ooh, hey, Cameron Egans. Yeah, uh, I am streaming live coding. You should definitely make the next one. Some more, some more uh, 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 Drupal crossovers going on here. All right. Anyway, thanks, everyone. That is all for today. Take care. Catch you next time.